It is Monday, July 16th, 2018. It is 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, because we're doing something special, so you know exactly what time it is. It's time for a little bit of coin metal. And we do have a very, 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 very special guest coming on a little bit later today, just in a moment or two. We're going to do our first dance and all that business. I have not been to jiu-jitsu yet today, so I can't really tell exactly how productive it's going to be, but I'll be sure to update you on Wednesday. <laughs> anyway, let's go ahead and throw right down into some music to uh, break it in. And uh, then from there, uh, we will be having Mr. Soonrock on for a much-awaited interview. And uh, let me pull up our first dance. And I I'm only going to play it because I know he loves this song. And, uh, you know, we, we, like to be, uh, we like to be accommodating here on Coin Metal. So here it is. Ministry, Rio Grande Blood. First dance here on Coin Metal. And that was Megadeth with Holy Wars, The Punishment Due. And as promised, I do have with me Mr. Soonrock, Verge Dev himself, Justin Vendetta. Thank you for joining me, sir. Hello, hello. <laughs> hello, hello, hello. How hello. you doing, Frank? I am doing very, very well. However, from uh, our recent discussion, not half as well as you did, um, or are doing... Uh, so yeah, how I'm was doing really it? Well. <laughs> How's it going over there in uh, Florida? There. Oh man, it's it's awesome. It's a really nice time of the year. You guys, uh, I mean, it's hot. It's hot. You know what I mean? Don't get me wrong. It's you know, you know, if you're outside all day, you're going to be sweating your ass off. But it's, it's a really nice time of year here. Excellent, sir. And uh, so we were talking about um, the the recent meetup over in Amsterdam. How was that for you? Oh my god, that was amazing! It was uh, definitely a culture shock. They have a they have a really really awesome culture there. Uh, the Dutch the Dutch have it have it going on, man. I mean they're they're doing it right over there. They're making us look bad. <laughs> yeah, you know, how would you? It say was like it, it's it's the first thing you really notice is like you know after you start to ask yourself a couple questions when you look around you realize that it's mostly because Holland doesn't rely on, like, war, debt, and oil. So, like, they just have this amazing, you know, amazing culture over there. Now, how, how would you say the differences are with regard to how, how they regard crypto over there? Or did you notice any? Oh, I think I think it's a, it's a lot bigger over there. Um, you know, it seems like most people are pretty hip to that kind of stuff. Um, you know, they're really progressive, you know, I guess for, for lack of a better word. A very progressive culture, you know. I would definitely say, if I had to guess, uh, you know, that c in contrast to America, I would say most Dutch probably know about uh, Bitcoin at, at minimum. Hmm. Yeah, I, I often wonder about that, how it is viewed in other other parts of the world. It seems we're received quite well over in uh, in the, the European nations as well as, as over in Asia, like South Korea and whatnot. But like, uh, what was the most striking thing you would say um, with regard to how they they look at crypto and we look at crypto? What was the biggest difference? Would you say? Um, I just think really, really, really the amount of people that are aware of it mm. uh, is probably the biggest difference. Um, you know, I mean, there's all different. You know, there's all different entry levels of knowledge pertaining to blockchain or crypto. Uh, but I think that just the amount of people that are that are aware of, of the technology in and of itself is just such is such a high number, you know. Mm. I mean, you go, you go here and you grab a crowd of ten people in a major city, and they've, you know, maybe half of them have heard of Bitcoin. But you know, I think if you did that in Holland or Amsterdam, you know, I think most people would all all have heard of Bitcoin, all of them. Nice. No, what, what would you say as far as their application of the technology? I mean, were you seeing a lot of vendors that were accepting cryptocurrencies as a medium of payment? I saw a couple of Bitcoin accepted here, uh, you know, stickers on windows of shops. Yeah, definitely. Definitely more so than I see, you know, when I'm in a metro area of, of uh, America. Nice. Well, it's, uh, I, well, like I said, I've I've always wondered about the uh, the differences in perspectives elsewhere, like... You know, do they view it as, as just another monetary vehicle or 
you know, do they they view it like we do? It's kind of revolutionary. I, I think they're more they're they're more like a forward thinking culture. You know what I mean? Like uh, like America really isn't a very uh, some of us are, but but America as a as a whole is not a forward thinking culture. You know, like we still use uh, you know a lot of disposable plastics and stuff like that. You know, we're still pumping gas nonstop and buying cars that you know get really shitty mileage per gallon. You know, and over there. You know, they're not reliant on oil, so, you know, a lot of people are driving hybrids and full electric cars. Um, you know, there's more people that are aware of crypto, you know, it's... I know they have a lot of bikes. I, I, guess it's, I guess it's more progressive, you know, more forward-thinking over there. Hmm, okay. And now, um, with regard to Verge, um, what would you say, like, your, your biggest uh, impact was from that, from the uh, experience itself, the meetup? Oh, it was it was like rejuvenating for me, you know, because uh, I spend so much time working on Verge that I don't really, um, you, you know, I've never I've never seen a manifestation of how many people are actually involved in Verge uh, up until then. Uh, you know, I, I've been in chat rooms and seen numbers. You know, it's like oh, we have forty, you know, thousand people in this chat room, or you know, ten thousand, you know, here, or hundreds of thousands on Twitter. But uh, it becomes a lot more real. Uh, when you see it and when you see a physical manifestation of it and so many people there. Um, so, I mean, it was definitely rejuvenating, you know, it kind of rekindled uh, my passion, I suppose, for, for working on it. Well, I, I can certainly appreciate that. I mean, cause I was in the IRC when, you know, we were one sat on a couple of exchanges here and there and to see it blossom yeah, yeah. <laughs> and grow to, yeah. to uh, such a such a momentous thing, I, I think it's just so impressive. Well, I'm sure, you, you, you remember back when we probably had maybe like 50 people in the chat room, and yeah. then like when we broke like 100, it was like, wow, this is crazy, there's like 100 people in here. <laughs> well, well, what was cool <laughs> now was... It's, you know, now, now there's chat rooms with tens of thousands, you know? Well, I, I liked the, the rains and stuff like that. I mean, like back when people had the liquidity that they could just rain, right? That uh, right. That was just so cool. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. I mean, rains if, only, <laughs> if only we were so forward thinking. <laughs> rains for days. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know. There was, I, uh, we calculated it the, uh, a couple of months ago in the Discord chat when uh, such pool minor pools and like a few other of us when we all rained there was a day where we rained like 10 or 15 million dollars worth of verge <laughs> it's like man if any if any of us knew <laughs> maybe i'll huddle <laughs> yeah i i don't know like i said i i think that i saw it go on with bitcoin I mean, I was around, you were around Bitcoin too before there was even a, a price in U.S. dollars, and then all of a sudden, you know, there's like yeah. meetups all over the place, and you know, it's a global phenomenon. So I mean, it's not like it didn't happen before, but like, like you're saying, actually seeing a physical representation of bodies in 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 house, that's that's a real good affirmation. So with yeah, the, well, you know, you know, it's funny because uh, you know, being in crypto. Uh, for a long time kind of earns your respect even from people that you might not get along with you know it's at the end of the day people just kind of have to, you kind of have to respect each other's time you know so when i when i see people from like you know 2012 2011 that i used to talk to when i first got into crypto because a lot of us knew each other you know what i mean it was a very close-knit small community yeah. you know so it's like even even these days when you know you see people you didn't really get along with you still you know respect them um that's why it's funny to see guys like uh like the tone vase guy or whatever you know, it's like, dude, Verge's blockchain is older than him in crypto. <laughs> and he's like, you know, talking shit about Verge and token pay and all this shit. And it's like, dude, our blockchain is fucking older than you in crypto. Well, so now let's talk a little bit about that. You know, there, this recent partnership between you, token pay, and I get Litecoin now? Well, we uh, Verge and, and Litecoin don't have a direct uh, partnership. But yeah, token pay... Uh, uh, formed a uh, partnership with the Litecoin Foundation, and uh, you know they're going to be working together on bringing out new uh, types of merchant stuff, I believe, and you know trying to. Obviously, I mean the end goal for for a lot of us is you know just to make uh, crypto more adopted and make it easier for adoption. Hmm. And now, what do you see Verge's position in all of that? 
as being? Uh, I don't know. I mean, we just kind of sail along, and you know, whenever uh, you know we see you know stuff that's going on, you know, it's usually somebody from Token Pay notif- notifies us. But uh, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I think it's cool. You know, Litecoin's been around forever. Oh yeah. Uh, so. Well, it, it, it's one of the first altcoins, so yeah, definitely. Now, with regard to the um, partnerships that have been going on, I, I've noticed that I'm seeing more adoption with regard to Verge in particular. And uh, I mean, how is that for you to, to finally see that kind of affirmation like as a current Oh, year? man, uh, I want to say it was like a couple of days before I went to Amsterdam. Uh, my, my girl was actually on our website looking at all our vendors, and I hadn't even looked at the list myself like in like probably a couple of months. And uh, I was like, holy shit, like, I can't believe how many vendors are on here, and all these people except Verge. This is nuts. And, you know, a lot of that was, uh, you know, after we partnered with MindGeek, that was kind of a catalyst, uh, you know, and from, from that point forward, it was like, you know, we started getting a vendor a day almost. Hmm. And sometimes we'd get multiple vendors a day. Wow. I had to shut off notifications from the, uh, from the website's repository on GitHub because I was getting notified, like, every five minutes, like... <laughs> Those guys, those guys are killing it, though. Like, I think one of the best things that we've ever did was open source our website because it's so cool to see, like, so many people just working on the website, like, literally 24-7. Yeah. Well, now, with regard to the expansion of Verge, I mean, is there anything that you're, you're working on right now that you could kind of allude to for the immediate future? Uh, for Verge? Yeah. Oh, our, well, our new code base is uh, just about done. Uh, I'm actually going to bring in some of the other guys from the team uh, within the next couple of days and have them start testing it and uh, playing with it, um, you know, and, and then we'll and then we'll release it publicly. Uh, so yeah, so that's really exciting because it's you know it's the latest Bitcoin or a lot of it's the newest Bitcoin uh, code base. Um, so I think that that'll help us uh, in adoption as well. Uh, that'll help us uh, be able to build out a uh, BitPay suite so that we can have, uh, you know, a full REST API and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So uh, I'm, I'm excited about that, you know, and then we have, a, you know, stuff that uh, TokenPay is working on uh, for Litecoin, TokenPay, and Verge. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, there's, there's constantly stuff going on. I mean, you know how it is. It's, you know, every, every two or three days something, you know, pretty relative happens in, in Verge. Oh, yeah, definitely. Well, I mean, Whether that, it's, you know, a new vendor or, you know, some kind of new software, new exchange, you know, new service. And now there, there's, there's been a, a spate of hacks recently, though. And I was wondering what kind of, uh, what kind of implementations you're, you're going through for, like, this, uh, this code base revamp um, that, that is meant to, like, address the, uh, the hack interfaces that you, you'd recently experienced. Um, well, yeah, I mean, the new code base covers a lot of that. Uh, you know, we have a lot more checks uh, on the valid, uh, validity of blocks. Um, so, I mean, we'll explain it all about how all the new stuff works. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm excited about it. So, Well, now, there, there's also talk of a, a new revision of the black paper. I was wondering, uh, it, that's, a, that's your crypto rect, actually. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know how Crypto Rect is, man. He's a monster. He's like, you know, once he once he starts something, he just keeps building it up. You know, and he was the uh, he was the first one to actually. I mean, we we were we probably didn't have an actual white paper drafted for like our first year, and then Rect one day was just like, I'm making a, a fucking black paper, and that's that. And then like within a few months, it was like translated in multiple languages and you know twenty pages. So yeah, I'm looking forward. I mean, to that's you know. I'm, I'm sorry. He, he's a beast when it comes to that. He's a beast when it comes to that kind of stuff. Nice. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm looking forward to it. Now, you saw recently that Code uh, Coinbase is uh, expanding the currencies that they're accepting. Uh, what do you think about that? As far as, uh, I think that that's you know that makes sense. Um, you know, for, on their part, I mean, obviously, it's more money. Uh, I mean, and it's without really a lot of cost. I mean, it's relatively simple once you have an exchange foundation to add more coins to it, you know. So I think one of the most profitable things for, I think, most exchanges these days uh, is actually adding coins and, and getting and charging them because, you know, they make, you know, a ton of money that way. 
on top of the fees, you know, collected from trading. So, I mean, I think it's a smart move for the Coinbase company. Um, but I meant the, the you know, points in cer- particular. It cer- certainly doesn't hurt adoption, but, you know, I've had my own issues with Coinbase, so... Yeah, I, um, I've had a few myself. I, I mean, not, not like, terrible, terrible ones, but eh, they, their service could be mildly improved at the least. I mean, the... Uh, well, you remember that article that just recently came out, right, that... Uh, there was like what like 20,000 complaints against Coinbase to the SEC or something like that uh, no I did not catch that but I will look it up as a matter of fact right now and that will have something to read if we depart early <laughs> yeah um I, I don't know I mean what, what is what? oh yeah so so uh, this is what it was there's 134 pages of complaints filed to the SEC about Coinbase hmm well, I guess if you're going to be Dude, a that's, big dog, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, you got to got to be able to deal with that kind of uh, level of scrutiny, certainly. Um, but then again, then again, I mean, who's to say that because they have so many users that you know, 134 pages isn't just 134 users, and those 134 users were like noobs that got their accounts hacked because of their own fault or something, you know? Yeah, that, and that's so it's, it's tough. It's tough. It's tough to judge, you know, from a headline like that, but. You know, my, my biggest, like, axiom with regard to crypto has become do not attribute to malice that which could just as easily be explained by stupidity. <laughs> I mean, because yeah, there, there's... We're doing this in, like... We might as well be, like, walking on the moon or trying to plant crops on Mars or something like that. We're creating a user-created currency and then a cur- a an economy on top of that and trying to interface it with the legacy markets that exist. And like I said, there's no map for this territory. People are going to make mistakes. Yeah, exactly. It's and you know and and we're still not nobody's really still defined the regulation that's going to happen, you know. It's still between the CFTC and SEC, you know, and they're both, you know, kind of going in a loop, so you know, I think over the next five years or so, I think we'll see more clear, uh, you know, regulations and, you know, written on paper, carved <laughs> into stone. <laughs> well, I, I sometimes get the impression that there are some that are already planning quite far ahead with regard to that. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that the government just wants whatever's going to make them the most money. Oh, I, I can certainly agree with that. Hmm. Yeah. So what new things do you see for Verge on the horizon, good saw? Or could you allude to that? Um, well, new, new code base, and I think with this new code base, it'll, lot, it'll be a lot easier to create more apps. Uh, so I think that, you know, after this code base comes out, I think I'm going to kind of go nose down and start working on uh, busting out a lot more applications. Um, and, you know, that's, that's, that's my plan. Uh, who knows what the world's plan is for Verge, you know? <laughs> Indeed, indeed. Well, now, with, with regard to apps, like, what kind of demand are you really seeing as far as, like, you know, the the market, the greater market at large? What kind of things are they asking for? Uh, well, a lot of people just don't really know how easy it is to use, uh, to use crypto in general as a payment option. Uh, you know, and since Verge is listed on so many different services that do that kind of stuff, um, and there's more in the works, uh, you know, I think that that's really kind of one of the biggest things is like there's like a mental barrier for a lot of places that are just like, you know, I don't understand how I can, you know, get paid in crypto and, you know, they think of the price changes that they're going to get screwed, so hmm. so my plan is really to start working on a lot more applications like, you know full API sets and all different languages uh, you know, that utilize all the different new RPC codes that we'll have um, stuff like that you know, I think that's one of the things that I've really enjoyed about Verge is that it's always seemed to me that your implementations are, are more like let the user make up their mind how they're going to use it. Here's the tools yeah. to facilitate that. <laughs> right. That's, you know, it's kind of one of those things where it's uh, it's kind of like a DIY. You know, we have a lot of DIY stuff, you know. We have like a library in just about every programming language already for Verge. Uh, that's just kind of like a here. This is how you can access uh, 
the blockchain itself. So now you can use this in whatever you want. Go run with it, you know. Well, I mean, I, I see that in a stark contrast to a lot of other projects, uh, Bitcoin being one of them, where there's been kind of this, you know, command down kind of thing where there are certain individuals and, and certain entities in this space that think that they can point to other people and say, you do this and you're going to do it this way. And there's the rest of us going, no, I don't think I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Uh, you know, Bitcoin has... I think something like 500 developers that have contributed to it but really there's only like 20 or 30 that are you know constantly working on it hmm. but uh but a lot of them do get to make their own decisions and do pretty much whatever they want i mean obviously some of them work for blockstream so you know they're they're going to want to you know do things that are you know to bitcoin that are more beneficial for blockstream and vice versa you know there's, there's definitely a lot of influence that goes into bitcoin now you know from the outside not necessarily uh, enough of what the users want, um, you know, going into that. Well, you know, given your perspective with regard to crypto, what, what do you think would make the biggest difference with regard to that? Like, it, it you know, what would in, engender, I, I guess, would would be my, my word, and what would bring the the thing back around to where it was a more user-based thing would you say like greater participation or or uh yeah or uh you know maybe maybe some sort of voting system on the uh on the uh source code would be nice so that anybody with like a legit account can actually you know vote maybe vote with satoshis or something or uh i don't know there's really no perfect method of doing it but i mean it would just be nice if you, if users had a more of a voice. I mean, you remember before all the Segwit lighting note stuff happened, everybody was talking in such simple terms where they could have just increased the block size or uh, divvied up the reward over the remaining nine minutes of space between blocks. Um, and, you know, you would still have the same outcome and you would have been able to hold more transactions. And, you know, instead it turned into this giant thing where, like, people argued about it over, like, years and it, like, actually affected the market price and stuff of it. So, I don't know. Yeah, I, I often think that the next generation of people coming into this space, um, having the benefit of media like this and, and, of course, other media that's up on, like, YouTube and various other um, places, that... With with regard to these things, when they're making decisions in the future, that they they have the benefit of our experience put out here, you know. Right. And so I I got to yeah. <laughs> Go I mean that's that's really what it takes too is just you know more developers to come in and you know come up with solutions. Hmm. I couldn't agree more, sir. Well, um, where would you like to go from here? I mean, you, you've got a whole bunch of hardware going on. There. I mean, I I would imagine you're you're cracking out a bunch of apps these days, or getting ready to at least. Oh man, yeah, I just built a monster here. My computer was out of commission for quite a long time, uh, almost a month, uh, just before uh, the Amsterdam trip. Uh, my computer was completely out of commission. My, well, my main computer. Um, and then it turned into like this crazy debacle where I swapped out two graphics cards, and then when I got the new ones in, the uh, heat sink on my CPU was too big, so then I ordered liquid cooling, and then the radiator for the liquid cooling wouldn't fit on the case, so then I ordered a new case, and then after I ordered a new case, I said, man, I almost have a new computer here, why don't I just order another CPU and motherboard, and you know... So, I don't know, it turned into a whole mess, but yeah, now I have this monster computer, which is really nice. Good deal, sir. Good. Well, now, um, do you have any other exchanges that you're anticipating to uh, take on Verge soon? Um, after the new code base comes out, I really want to start trying to take a look at more decentralized uh, options. Because um, there's so many now. Uh, like a year ago, there was like a half a dozen, uh, and they there was... Nobody really knew anything about them. Uh, now there's a couple dozen, so I really want to start focusing on uh, decentralized exchanges and see what I can do to help them, to see what, see what we can do to get Verge on them, uh, and see what we can do to get people using them. 
So uh, have you been noticing a more a more migration to OTC markets and whatnot in, in a more decentralized um, exchange? Well, well, yeah, those have always been around. Uh, but, you know, I think that the most popular right now are obviously centralized exchanges and over-the-counter. Um, and I, I think it would be nice to see more decentralized apps, uh, you know, that, that let people exchange directly. Now, are, what what kind of options are you seeing right now? Or are, are you willing to disclose them? Um, yeah, I mean, I want to start working on, on stuff first before we really start talking about who and what we're doing. Good enough. Um, <laughs> but, the, but, but, you know, I'm going to tell you right now, it's not just going to be like we're going to pick one. You know, I mean, obviously we'd like to be listed on several. Uh, mm. You know, we'd like to, you know, see what we can do to help them. So... Indeed, indeed. Well, sir, I'm a bit out of questions. I don't know what you got. Um, yeah, that's about it, man. I'm probably going to go eat dinner after this. All right, sir. Well, then I'm going to take this opportunity. It's almost six on my coast. <laughs> I, f- I always forget we have a time difference of what, like three hours, right? Yeah, it is. And yeah. It, that well, you know, that's hours. why I wanted to do this at two instead of instead of eight my time because then it wouldn't be you starting at eleven o'clock your time, which yeah, I, I imagine that is exactly why we missed you last time, isn't it? Yep. You finally yep, discovered exactly sleep. <laughs> Not only that, but it just it had just been a while since I had done a show <clears throat> at night with you, uh, so I forgot what time you told me, and then. Uh, you know, just after that, after after I messaged you and I didn't hear back within like an hour or so, I was just like, all right, I guess we're not going to do it or something. And then I just passed out. Ah, it happens, sir. It happens. Yeah, you know, I, I don't spend all of my time in front of my computer as much as I do spend in, time in front of this thing. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I was up and around doing some stuff outside and I, I didn't even notice that you had messaged me back until I came back in here, like getting ready for the show. I'm like, oh. Oh shit! That was like five o'clock my time. And I'm like, oh no, no, no! And so that you know, I started trying to get a hold of you, and I, I ended up getting crypto wrecked on here, and that that was enlightening even in, in and of in itself. Really, I, I I really enjoyed having him on. And as a matter of fact, that's like one of the most viewed videos I have at this moment. It's like I, I want to say it's like 580 or 590 views on on YouTube. So I was pretty happy with that. Although I'm sure this one will get more. <laughs> yeah, you know it's uh, it's pretty cool too. We've had a lot of people working on the uh, the new GUI for the wallet, and like there's like three developers uh, now that have just been going nuts on it, which is pretty awesome. Um, well, you know, I was telling and, uh, you one of them. One of them is uh, Sven, uh, who's I haven't really uh, sat down and talked to yet, but. Uh, he seems pretty good. He's working nonstop on it, uh, you know. And the whole project that Martin started on it is just, you know, it's pretty awesome. I can't wait to see what it looks like with the new uh, code base under it. Nice, nice. So now, um, wait a minute. You're, you're so we've got a new wallet release coming then. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. When the new code base is out, we're gonna have a whole new, whole new thing coming out. It's well, gonna be nuts. Well, I, I got a new machine, so I'm going to be more than happy to try it out on this if you give me the opportunity. Oh, yeah, you do have a new computer now. That's right. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I had to do something to offload some of my processing and, and stuff like that. And, you know, the thing is, is this is this is my every machine, and so it's like I can't really experiment with it, you know? It's like if, if I need uh, everything kind of stable on this machine, you know, I can't be installing a whole bunch of weird shit and whole bunch of wallets and so on and so forth as a matter of fact i end up getting um what do you call it crypto jacked half the time just looking through articles for this show so it's like if i had anything like you know that that had money on it or you know something like that i'd be kind of afraid of it getting extracted or exfiltrated or whatever so that's why i opted for another machine so i can actually do that sort of stuff you know where i can experiment Maybe even try lightning. <laughs> That's so crazy. Yeah, I want to actually start playing with uh, Lightning Network uh, after we get this new code base out. 
Right, just to see if you could get it to interface? Yeah, just to see what, you know, just to see what I can do to it. See if I can rip out any good parts to it. Yeah. Well, that's... Carrots guts out. That's what a good dev does. <laughs> Study what the other guy did. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's it's one of the drawbacks of open source is that the source is available to pretty much everybody. So, you know, I... I I find that very humorous, though, because as, as big a drawback as that would seem, it, it if you look around you, how much of the shit around you runs on Android? You know. Oh uh, well, yeah. Well, Android is pretty much Linux, so. <laughs> yeah, it seems like Linux runs everything around me. It runs my TV. It runs my my tablet. It's right. always it's always been that way. Most people just don't really know that. Most consumers uh, usually end up going Windows or Mac, but they don't really think about how re- really almost every service around them is, you know, ran on on Linux in some form. Yeah, I, I had that same argument with somebody about um, Mac OS X. I'm like, it's basically Linux, and they're like, oh no, it's not. No, no. It's Open BSD, and I'm like, what's Open BSD? It's a Mac variant of Linux. <laughs> yeah, it's all it's all different flavors of the same ice cream. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I like I said, I've I've had that discussion in multiple times, and but people want to keep thinking that 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 differential actually exists. I I don't know. I find it very disturbing, especially th- with things like USB. You know, it's like when you got a connector for USB and it, and it doesn't have a USB that's like universal in some way, shape, or form. It's like, it's called USB for a reason. Uh, universal serial bus. It's supposed to be universal. Oh, <laughs> you know? uh, yeah. Yeah, and there's so many different... I really like the USB-C, though, because I like that it's symmetrical and there's no wrong way to plug it. Yes. Well, there, there are people that will plug it wrong anyway, I'm sure. I'll find some way to do it. Yeah, I... I don't know. I would like to see a little more thought go into making things tinier, smaller, you know? And I, um, I I see that on the hardware end, but not so much on the software end. There's always this, like, oh, let's see what else we can burden the CPU with. Let's, you know... <laughs> I mean, uh, the thing that bugs me, and it, it really got me the first time that I opened up my task manager was to to see what was going on after I had installed Google, right? And it had several instances of, of Google Chrome, and I'm like, why does it need so many instances of Google Chrome? I mean, you look, and it's like the, the biggest thing sucking up the most system resources is Google the entire time. And I, I just, I, I was here during the Netflix, or not Netflix, uh, what do you call it? Um, Netscape. You know, I, I remember when Netscape was the browser, you know, and it was a battle between that and, uh, what was it, uh, Microsoft Explorer or something. Or just... But anyway, the, um, the, the amount of burden that you experienced with those, those browsers versus Google Chrome or, or even Mozilla I, or many of the others, I, I just find it kind of disturbing that it is so heavy. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's always memory leaks in those things. What can you do? There's really no perfect browser out there, anyway. Well, now with regard to crypto, have you been impressed by any particular uh, anything in particular lately uh, outside of uh, maybe Verge? Uh, people's audacity. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, not really. To be honest, I, th- I feel like it's been kind of stagnant. What about you? Um, you know, I think that the uh, the whole ICO thing kind of kind of blew a hole in the the creative the creative chasm of of uh, crypto. That it took a lot of the creative energy and put it behind useless projects that were just going to run into walls. I mean, and I'm seeing a lot of uh, a lot of articles concerning the actual success rate of ICOs and how it's so abysmal. 
And I, I mean, it's predictable though, dude. You're, you're giving the fucking mouse the cheese before you even ask him to run the maze. I mean, do you yeah, think, it's definitely. Do you, do you really think that Verge would would be the success it is today if somebody gave you what its current market cap is and said, "Hey, make something successful"? Uh, I don't know. I think that I think you know we got big because we really put a lot of time and work into it. And nothing was handed to us. That's one of the reasons why I support it. <laughs> I watched Verge get to where it is. On its own merits. We had we had to fight tooth and nail, you know. <laughs> yeah, I and like I said, you know, I was there for most of that. So yeah, I, I that's one of the reasons why I support Virgin. And like I said, you know, having seen it done not once, not twice, but several times now, you know, between Verge, Bitcoin itself, other other cryptocurrencies on the exchanges that you know arose from nothing and and are what they are today you know ethereum all of them you know that oh yeah you remember when ethereum came out we uh we had a uh, rick had Vilik on the old uh, radio station indeed he did indeed he did. and every and and you know what was so funny is just like just like everyone else you know you have the option of when you hear a lot of fud to go you know go two of directions you know you can stop the project and say oh fuck it there's too much fud or you can just ignore it laugh and continue and uh you know there's so much yeah remember how much fud was there was against ethereum oh my god dude i, I, I mean it was just dude 24 7 it was like <laughs> big, ethereum's the biggest scam it's the fucking sh- it's shit it's the shit coin it's never gonna go anywhere blah 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 you know <laughs> and then it was like okay ethereum's now number two forever <laughs> Well, there has been speculation as far as the flippening, and and I guess our network is is getting quite large. It's funny though because uh, no, I, I I can't see that. But uh, it's funny because if you look at Ethereum's charts, they're like they literally follow Bitcoin, and every every single chart follows Bitcoin basically. Yeah, so I, I everybody just kind of gets in line. <laughs> Well, I, I had my own foot about Ethereum that I felt it was a scam platform. Not that it was it, it in itself was a scam, but that many people would use it for bad things. Many people would use it for good things, but that by and large, initially, people not knowing what to do with that much power and responsibility would abuse it. You know. Yeah. And, and that's that's kind of what we've seen. But you know, I, I don't fault Ethereum for that, not in the least. I, I'm actually I'm quite apl- I applaud Vitalik for giving them the place to burn out because only the people that were really serious to begin with are going to be are still going to be there on Ethereum in a year. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. He outpaced everybody. That's for sure. I'm I'm impressed. I mean, there's got to be so much pressure on him, you know. Oh, I can't. you can. I mean, you know, the cool thing though too is that he's always been himself. So he's like, you know, he's definitely had some meltdowns and stuff, you know, publicly, and it's like, but what he says makes sense, you know. I mean, I saw him rant probably six months ago about how uh, so many of people in the in the crypto community now, ever since it shot up to twenty grand and had you know this huge new influx of people, you know, he's talking about how toxic the community is, you know, and how they're all just money greedy people, and you know, he's one hundred percent correct. You know, we had a huge influx of those kind of people, so. You know, I, I definitely respect them for you know ignoring all that fud. I mean, dude, there was, there was I've I've never seen fud that bad against anything uh, like it was with Ethereum. I mean, people think that there's been fud against like Verge. Oh, it's, dude, you have no idea. Like, you should have seen how bad it was when Ethereum came out. Oh, I remember. I remember the the, the year that it was still kind of um, what do you call it? Um, vaporware. <laughs> uh, the, yeah. Yeah. That, that was yeah. People, fun. people were going bonkers, man. They fucking everybody, every single person, like ninety percent of the crypto community hated Ethereum. It, it did seem like that way for quite a while until they started getting some steam. Yeah, well, until Vilik just you know ignored it all, kept working on it, made the made it better, and you know, then people were like, "Oh shit, this is a whole new type of blockchain." 
maybe I should invest in this. <laughs> and they were smart for having done so. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I think that's that's just any kind of market that you're going to find out who's serious over the long term. It's it's an attrition game. Yeah. It is. Well, I'm I'm certainly glad to to see Verge having having sustained and and kept running as long as it has and I'm I know it's due in no small part to yourself and the crew. I, like I said, man, it's been inspiring really for me to see it bloom from just you and a couple other really hardcore coders to being what it is today. Right. Yeah, so I mean, that's, you know, I'll always be working on Verge. I mean, you know, I've been telling people that for years. And, you know, it's, it's you know, FUD, that's usually, that's a big question I get a lot too, is like, people are like, does FUD bother you? And I'm like, ah, <laughs> no, I expect it. No news is good. There's no FUD, man. If there's no FUD, you're not doing it right. Oh, yeah, dude. If you're not making enemies, you're not doing something right. <laughs> yeah. Something's, something's drastic, you know, drastically wrong. So, so yeah, I'm enjoying it, you know. I'm, uh, you know, I'm glad everything's kind of at a good spot right now. You know, this, there hasn't been any more mining exploits. Uh, you know, the new code base is almost ready to come out publicly. Um, you know, okay, we're at a really good time right now. Um, one thing you know, it looks like the market start, the, the Bitcoin market is starting to recover. You know, so it feels like, uh, like you know, we have the making of a, a perfect storm in a good way. Could, could you describe it a little bit in deeper deep detail exactly the type of hack it was, or the type of exploit? Uh, the uh, uh, the exploits that we had. So, um, basically, it was. Okay, so somebody was able to basically connect to our, our network um, using our, our source code uh, and then essentially drive the difficulty up really, really high on one of our algorithms and then sort of cut off communication with the rest of the network, mine a ton of blocks as the difficulty goes back down after they find that block on their own chain. Um, and then basically after they had mined a ton of blocks on their own chain with really, really low difficulty, they would submit them back onto ours. Hmm. And since since their chain was longer, our chain would say, oh, that must be, you know, the correct chain because it's it's longer. Um, and it was it was with script algorithm um, out of the five algorithms. So we changed it to say you can only submit five blocks of one algorithm in a row um, before it has to be something else. So then the next exploit, there was two. So the next exploit was a combination of Lyra 2 and script, and they basically were submitting 5 and 5, 5 and 5, 5 and 5. Mm. And uh, basically the same technique was used. It's just that they they were able to drive up the difficulty on both uh, algorithms so much, then mine their own uh, cutoff networks, um, and then mine with really, really low difficulty after that. So... Uh, Wow. You know, and it's a process that you know they had they did they had to do that for a few hours to accumulate a lot of blocks uh, before they connect again. Um, so yeah, it was the same process for both. Basically, it was just that they were able to spoof, uh, you know, or do that on two algorithms versus the one. So we patched it to also say that not only can you not submit more than five of the same algorithm, but now you can't have more than um, ten minutes of a uh, of a drift time. And these were you know, two or three hours worth of blocks. So that 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 attack is no longer uh, possible anymore. Hmm. Well, that's good. That's definitely good. Well, you know, I was just talking about this with CryptoRec the other day. It's the the fact that you actually were on the spot to to address it. I think that 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 is you know emblematic of the kind of value that you have for the coin. You know, I mean, if you just like sat by and watched it happen and said, "Oh, I don't know what to do." Um, that would have kind of. Oh man, both <laughs> both times, uh, I ended up staying awake for some ungodly amount of time. <laughs> now, what... you can't you can't sleep when it's something like this. It's like you know, it's it's like having like a pet and your pet is sick or something like that. It's like you know, it's important. You know, it's just one of those things. Now, one thing, have you noticed? It, is there any way to trace the source of the attack? Uh. 
I mean, probably, but to be honest, I haven't really bothered. I haven't bothered trying. I mean, you know, it's it's one of those things where, you know, basically how the law works is that if the person uh, violated a, a rule or a law or something like that, then, you know, then sure, we could go after them. But the fact is they used this software and a method that, you know, just worked out the way it did. So... You know, there's not really anything there, I don't think, from a legal standpoint. And unfortunately, I kind of have to respect it because they use the software fair and square. Well, the, the thing... You know, I... it's, not, it's, not, it's not like they hacked something to do it. You know, they didn't breach access, you know, any access or anything. They just abused the rules that were available. Exactly. Well, the, the, th- the reason why I asked that is because there have been a spate of attacks on other coins as well. And I have oh to, yeah, yeah, a lot of them. I have to wonder. Uh, if EOS it, had some kind of issue. Um, yeah, I read about a few of those. Oh, that one I think is Microsoft, but I, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> I mean, because I, I I developed a thesis where they basically it's either GitHub, somebody who hacked GitHub, somebody who hacked the guy's account for GitHub, somebody who hacked the computer of the guy, the, the, the developer that had the account for GitHub, or the, the developer himself, or Microsoft, because Microsoft owns GitHub. And Microsoft has a habit of, of doing stuff like that, so... That's, that's yeah, you know, <laughs> nothing. Nothing would surprise me if they were able to run some sort of vulnerability tester on like across the entire platform of GitHub, and then find things, you know, you know, find find ways of exploiting. Well, you yeah. got to remember too on GitHub, a lot of people use private GitHub repositories to back up their own infrastructure, and that stuff even contains passwords and stuff. So. You know, think about all the intelligence, uh, you know, that Microsoft gains from that acquisition. Oh, it's it's sickening. You know, they're they're getting network, they're getting server and network passwords for all kinds of services. Yeah, and and that's one of the reasons why I was I was suggesting to to people at the end of that, and I got to get that episode up, um, where I was saying, dude, it's like find another place to store your info, info just to eliminate that as a possible attack vector because. I mean, this is not like something that I'm saying with no history. You know, it's got it's got a history behind it. There's plenty of history for you to look up relating to what I'm talking about. It's not like you know I'm just making some unfounded accusation. This shit is this is a full contact sport out here, man. Right. <laughs> but I don't know. I I was just going on that because, like I said, it's not just Verge that got attacked in that way. I mean, there have been various attacks, like Bitcoin Gold, um, and, and there was another one recently too. Bankor had some sort of shit too. Um, but you know, like I said, it's not that it's something that's just happening with Verge. It's it's a rampant thing going on out there, and I gotta wonder if it's maybe the same individuals doing it. Yeah, I mean that's certainly a possibility, but you know you got to remember also all of these Bitcoin forks have made enemies with all of those Bitcoin Puritans, and some of those guys are really extremists. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So you know, almost instantly, any Bitcoin fork, you know, where it's actually forked off of Bitcoin's blockchain, like you know, at some block number, like a real fork. Uh, if any of those automatically become enemies of, you know, at least a couple dozen very crazy extremist Bitcoin Puritans. Hmm. And what would you say like, motivates them? Is it just an ideological thing? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I guess every every instance is different, but I, I mean, I, I don't. I just personally, I would never. I don't understand why these Bitcoin forks don't just fork. Bitcoin and start a new chain, you know? Mm-hmm. It's just such a lazy move to make a Bitcoin fork uh, and only change, like, a little tiny parameter. It's, you know, it's like, why are you keeping... Obviously, you've accumulated a lot of Bitcoins <laughs> before you did this fork. <laughs> yeah, just to give yourself plenty of whatever coin you create. Yeah, exactly. And then it's free because you still have your Bitcoins, too, anyway. It's like... I don't know. It's bizarre. 
<laughs> yeah, you know, I, I saw a, um, I saw that there was a meeting. Called what do you What do you think about Bitcoin Cash? Do you like Bitcoin Cash? I have mixed feelings about Bitcoin Cash um, because I, I when, I, when I, it first came, when it first came out, I hated it. Now I have I go back and forth. Like I, I understand the ideology, but I just have a hard time liking Roger Ver. I you know I find Roger Ver only m- mildly intolerable. I mean, I, I I like most of what comes out of his mouth, but he he does get a teeny tiny manic at times, and and that gets annoying. Um, but the where was I going with that? Kind of Bitcoin Cash, as far as my own personal experience with it is, it's it's kind of following the path of Bitcoin in some ways. Um, if you if you look at some of the uh, the uh, the main uh, the ways you can look at how many transactions are doing the, you find out that there's transactions that are sitting longer than 10 minutes in my mind yeah. there's absolutely no fucking excuse for that you've got 32 megabytes worth of fucking block space stuff the fucking transactions in the fucking block <laughs> yeah it doesn't make sense you know I mean that was supposed that was supposed to be the whole magic of uh, Bitcoin Cash and what it solved. Dude, my tr- my transaction waited two hours for its first confirmation, and that was from an exchange to an exchange. So, Jeez. give me a fucking break, man. That's there's no excuse for that as far as I'm concerned, and that's that's derived from my own experience. You know, I mean, real realistically, I would have rather used Verge. It would have happened a lot fucking faster. You know, so, oh yeah. You know, it's like, but it's just well, and it's bizarre though too because that's what it was meant to, you know, solve. Bitcoin Cash was supposed to be fast. Well, it's supposed to solve that that transaction volume issue. It's like, what difference does it make if you've got thirty two megabytes worth of space if you're holding them back because they're not hitting your per satoshi per kilobyte threshold? Give me a fucking break. Yeah, but. My my experience otherwise with Bitcoin Cash has been really positive. You know, that I've made plenty of money in arbitraging it from Bitcoin to Bitcoin Cash to US dollars. You know, so Oh well. Yeah. And so I, I can't I can't feel too bad about it. Um, but it, at the same time though, like I said, they, they need to resolve that shit. They they do not need a fucking mempool with 32 megabytes worth of fucking space to put in put transactions into blocks. You know, I mean, if you if you're trying to enhance your your adoption, you, you have to have fast throughput. You have to be utilizing your your capacity. Otherwise, it's just wasted. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I mean, and, and to that point, you know, I mean, if you had two two hundred transactions that were like say point five satoshis per kilobyte that's still a lot more transactions than you than you would have had previously so just that bump up in in the minor fees in and of itself i would expect to be enough motivation to drive more miners to it you know yeah you'd you'd like to think uh but you know that's that's been my my big block argument is that <clears throat> If you do have bigger blocks and you are f- utilizing the bigger blocks, that we should be using like 64 megabyte blocks or 128 megabyte blocks. I mean, especially with given how cheap drive space has become. Yeah, drive space is, is really cheap now. Well, hard, hard disk drives have become really cheap. Solid states are still pretty expensive. Well, even so, they're coming down in price, dude. I mean... I I've, I think they're down to what like twenty five cents a terabyte or I mean a, a megabyte, uh, something like that. Whereas they used to be about a dollar a megabyte. Yeah the um the the SSD market is definitely getting better, and I think you're talking about gigabytes, like a dollar. The a only thing I don't the only thing I don't like about it is uh. That you know, like the hard disks are still easier to recover data from. Like if your solid state dies, like you're pretty much screwed. Right. But like you know, the old hard drives are so much easier to recover your data from. Like if they burnt out. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that uh, I, I've always been a bigger proponent of of actual hard drives 
than than solid state. I, I've never been a big fan of using flash RAM for for my fucking drive. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I think that Bitcoin Cash is is showing us though that bigger blocks are possible, and I think that's probably the only thing that can be said about it at this point. That until they're really facilitating the the full utility of their of their market, I mean their their uh, blockchain that they're not they're not everything they can be or everything that bitcoin can be you know yeah so do that's you, true of anybody do, do you ever see a, a possibility where where we could see not just blockstream being the people that are getting their bips put through for bitcoin uh i don't know man i really don't know the future of Bitcoin is, is definitely uncertain. Yeah. Well, you know, what do you think of the claims that some people make that changes or, or augmentations or improvements in Bitcoin would eliminate the need for altcoins? What's that? What 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 do you think about those or what is your opinion on on whether or not improvements in Bitcoin would do anything to eliminate the need for altcoins or market for them? Uh, no, <laughs> no. I think that's already that's already been that's we've already seen that that's the case. That uh, altcoins are necessary. Um, you know, Bitcoin will sort of be the basis or you know backing of the market. But you know, it's it's clear that they're only willing to you know go so far with you know certain aspects of Bitcoin. Um, you know, like they've already had people propose, you know, really awesome security features and uh, privacy features, and you know they've been rejected. So, so then you you see that there will always be some sort of market for for people that do want things that Bitcoin just can't do or doesn't do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I'm definitely there with you. I, I'm. My perspective has always been that there aren't enough altcoins yet. <laughs> right. You know, I I was just seeing the other day there there was something like a it was a imp, sorry an image showing how much debt there is and it's like the the global deficit's like two hundred forty five trillion dollars, right? So I I right. I tweeted that and I said that's a that's a shit ton of liquidity to tokenize. <laughs> If you think you're early yeah. in, in cryptocurrency, you're you're fucking stupid. <laughs> well, I think that's I think that's my biggest pet peeve about crypto right now is like in the top you know hundred coins, there's a couple dozen ERC twenty tokens, and it's like why? I don't know. Maybe they at one time or another hope to have their own blockchains and be independent of Ethereum and be their own market, but. The likelihood is pretty low. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. Well, now, what, what do you think of uh, Tether? I mean, have you have you been watching that at all? Uh, well, the last I had read was maybe like a month ago, and I guess they said a lawyer came out and said that uh, Tether was liquid and that they were solid, good to go. Yeah, they they were. But they were. I, I thought that that would have. Uh, I thought, if anything, that would have been like a catalyst to make Bitcoin go back up. Uh, maybe if they didn't print like 300 million right after that <laughs> put 300 million what or uh, is it 300 million or three yeah 300 million um, uh, new tether oh they minted 300 million new tether yeah but don't they, but weren't they using them to buy more bitcoin but, well <laughs> yes and the the whole thing is is a big debacle, dude. I I made an episode on it, and I, basically I said like you know EOS, um, Bitthumb, uh, uh, what was the other one? Bitfinex or USDT? Whose loss was it anyway? Where I think all of these entities are counting the same, you know, two point four to four billion US dollars as an asset on their balance sheet. Wow, that's kind of nutty. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, I know it's kind of nutty, but I mean, the thing is, is 
e- even that lawyer thing, I-, I read the statement here on the show. Um, it was not a positive verification of Jack's shit other than the fact that they do have or did have access to a bank account that did have, at the time that the lawyer was in the office or whatever, or was able to confirm it, a volume of U.S. dollars at a certain amount. That's what they were willing to attest to. They weren't They weren't willing to attest to anything else. You know, like, it was a limited time window and, and so on and so forth. I mean, dude, you can move funds around plenty, you know, but they, they did say that they had, you know, some sort of verification that they had continuous access to those funds. Now, whether they still have access to those funds is anybody's guess, you know? Right. Yeah, or if it even belonged to them to begin with. Right. You never you never know, man. I mean, there's definitely a lot of assumptions can be made. Yeah, and and I mean, I, I don't want to assume... But, but at the same time, though, but at the same time, it just sounds so Federal Reserve-y. Like, how do you just say, like, okay, now we're going to mint $300 million. Like, what's the science, and why isn't that part public? Well, well, supposedly they have the the reserves for it, but it's just like it, it, you have to trust them, and, and you shouldn't have to trust anything in crypto. You should be able to verify it. <laughs> right, right. Well, I wonder what their formula though is for when they decide that they're going to mint more tethers. Oh, they they probably get some disbursement of U.S. dollars from somebody, you know, like a the Federal Reserve or somebody like that. You know, but I, I don't nah. know. It's just a bunch of question marks, as far as I'm concerned, dude. It's it's a bunch of question marks. Mm, yeah, definitely strange. Indeed. Yeah, I don't know. I I know that for right now, at least, you know, while we are in a, a marketplace, a global marketplace where it's dominated by fiat currencies, we do have to retain those those interfaces. But how much longer do you think until we start seeing more more full loop systems? You know, where people are are buying their supplies to make their products in in Verge currency or Litecoin or Bitcoin or whatever, and then selling it for Bitcoin or Litecoin or whatever to their next step up and all the way out to retail. Hmm. I mean. D- d- how how much line? I'm just asking on a general fr- frame time. What do you think? Like a couple of years, maybe, until we start. Seeing uh, no, I'd like to think sooner than that. I think that uh, I think the next time that Bitcoin sees a bull run, I think that's going to like light a fire again under a lot of people and get you know. I think a lot of work is going to start suddenly getting produced magically. Uh, you know, so I'm just kind of you know I'm prepping for that. But yeah. I think I think that you know I think our next our, our next big run I think will ignite the industry uh, a lot and I think that we're going to start seeing a lot new uh, a lot of new apps and services coming out um, especially man if we really need easier adoption to get into crypto it's just it's really really that's that's really the number one focus for everybody. Well, it's it's made me want to set up like a workshop at a uh, at like one of these public centers, you know, like a. Um Sometimes at schools they have like an adult center or something like that where it's like an adult resource center where you go and you learn about computers or or other things like that, but it's all community driven. And we have a few of those those kind of places in in town and I've been thinking about trying to set up some sort of presentation where, you know, we have hardware on site and we're using it to you know, download and install wallets and show how transactions work and, and so on and so forth and basically teach the the fundamentals of cryptocurrencies and how to utilize them, you know, and like invite local retailers and stuff to to them. Yeah. Well, I mean that's I know Token Pay is working on a lot of that kind of stuff too. Uh, you know, merchant platform stuff and you know, ease ease of use. You know, there's there's two people though. You have to constantly look out for. You have to look out for the company that's going to be using the software, and then obviously the people that are going to be purchasing. You know, using it, the customer experience. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that you know, I think most of the focus really needs to be on on that experience in and of itself. You know, that's part of the part of the adoption process. So when you were uh, when you were developing the latest iteration of the wallet. 
Um, what would you say the biggest request was as far as like you know things that you were addressing that was user driven? You know, like th- this is a response um, to this kind of request. Dude, you should actually take a look at uh, the GUI wallet uh, and see. It's funny because there's been so many people just like requesting things and like discussions about it, and they just kind of get it done. It's actually really impressive to watch. <laughs> No. I get emails all the time. That's one of the uh, repositories I actually haven't unsubscribed, so like I'm constantly getting email blasted all day when they're making updates to it. Mm. And uh, there's a lot of conversations where people are just like, oh, can we do this? And then like somebody comments like an hour later, done. <laughs> so it's really cool to see. It's, uh, it's, it's, I mean, right now it's really being developer-driven because it's developers talking to other developers you know, about things that would, that would be cool to implement, and then they're actually implementing them. But... Uh, you know, as more people, uh, you know, start to learn how to use GitHub, I think that, you know, more more normal users that are not developers, uh, you know, will start being able to make requests. Hmm. Nice. So, like, as far as, like, the implementations that are coming out on this next iteration of the wallet, you don't have anything specific? Or... I mean, like, what, what's a big change you can tell us? <laughs> I'm excited. I want to download it. <laughs> oh well, uh, well for well the GUI uh, is like an overlay to the to the background, um, but it's just going to be a lot more options in it. Um, you know, there's just so many more RPC commands uh, for obtaining information related to transactions, uh, memory pool stuff like querying memory pool stuff. Um, so you know, it's it's going to be nice. I think we're going to be able to actually produce a lot of. Uh, further analytics for of our blockchain uh you know obviously non-privacy invasive ones but uh i think we'll be able to produce a lot more really nice analytics uh that'll come out of this and uh as far as the information itself from the analytics what would you who would you say that's going to be most useful for uh probably merchants uh and stuff like that you know vendors will probably be able to see how many uh, transactions they can process uh, how fast they are, how fast the average transaction uh, is, how much the average transaction costs, stuff like stuff like that, you know. That is some really useful intel for for retailers, I would think. I mean, because it it would certainly give you like real time ways to evaluate how you want to transact. I mean, if you do have a choice, or if that is you know within your your desires, it's certainly within mine. But I I think it would uh, it it's the it's a good kind of tool, I would think, to evaluate which coin would be best to use at any one time. You know. Yeah, for sure. You know, depending on the market. But you know, it's it'll also you know obviously if we see any issues or things that we'd like to improve, it's also a good measurement for the for us as the developers, uh, you know, to see what could use being improved in the blockchain. Certainly. Yeah, I, um, Constant real-time deep analytics of a blockchain are, are will be a very good thing all the way around. Yeah, I, I could certainly appreciate that. I mean, because when I was doing things in manufacturing, there was a uh, issue that I uh, I came upon where one of my my maintenance techs had a machine that was down, and it had been down for like three days. And one day I came up to him, I was just curious or whatever, I come up to him like, you know, what the hell is going on with this? You know, why, are you st- why do you still have these machines down? And he says, yeah. there, there's some issue that happened, you know, three days ago or whatever, and they can't track it down. And I said, okay, well, you know, these machines store wafer maps of all the wafers that get processed on them, right? And like, yeah. Why not go through by the timestamp and you can figure out exactly which wafer it started on? And that basic uh, that that got those machines restarted and whatnot. But that was something that like the maintenance techs missed it. His lead missed it. His leads lead missed it. The the technicians they missed it. It's like, dude, this you store all this fucking information in a server. It's all got timestamps on it. There's no reason why you can't go back through and say, okay, this is exactly the way for it started on. <laughs> I mean, because. I caught another one like that where somebody hadn't been aligning the uh, realigning the machine, and uh, it was coming up with a bunch of false negatives. You know, f- uh, failed failed die that that weren't really failed die, 
And so I took a look at the scope and it, it showed how far off the uh, touchdowns were from where they were supposed to be on the wafers. And when we tracked oh, it, wow. it, that machine, when it does that test, it's to verify whether or not those die are good. So it determines whether the 160 process steps that it had been through were a complete waste of time for that that die or not, right? And so when you're looking nice. at each one of those die, you know, you're talking about like $8 worth of cost. And when I'm mm-hmm. looking at the, the wafer map, and out of 16 of those, every time it touches down, it's showing that our two of them are good, there's something really wrong, right? So yeah, of course. When we tracked that one down, dude, it, it, had, it had been falsely scrapping 95% yield dye for three days. <laughs> oh, my God. $8 a dye, 220 dye per wafer, 45 wafers per cassette, seven cassettes. You do the math. A lot of fucking money, like a quarter million dollars worth of worth of wafers falsely scrapped. And the Jeez. the fuck thing is that basically got me fired <laughs> catching that. Oh my god! Yeah, because it, it it showed that the three shifts, the other three shifts that worked my department, hadn't been bothering to check to see if the if the machine was even aligned. They were just stuffing wafers in that thing and hitting start. <laughs> oh my god <laughs> incompetence yeah but I mean that that's kind of like a blockchain thing you know timestamps in a database and yeah yeah definitely it kind of ties back to what you were talking about with deep analytics of your your blockchain that you'd be able yep. to see when a, a specific um, issue arose yep definitely definitely I don't know about you, man. Should, but, uh, should, should be pretty simple to timestamp stuff, too, along an assembly line. Well, no, didn't, didn't we talk about that with regard to um, timestamping the uh, the duration a block should take? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think that would be a, a good way to mitigate some of the, the script mining you were talking about, where, like, if they weren't actually doing the work to to complete the blocks that it would take them shorter period of time than actually mining them, you know? Yep. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. It, it seems like the, there's more and more resistance to, to altcoins. It, would you say at all there's a possibility that your idealist could be the, the uh, party behind it? <laughs> or would you speculate that far? <laughs> yeah. No. Um, I mean... It's it's crazy because I think that you know we're going to start seeing blockchains in just about everything soon. Uh, like I think what is it Dubai is uh, twenty twenty blockchain. They made a commitment to like have everything uh, running on uh, blockchains by twenty twenty. So that's you know two years away, not even a year and a half. Well, I mean, when you hear that kind of aspiration, what do you think of it? I mean, you're a developer. Uh. It doesn't sound realistic. Uh, into in you know another year and a half, um, but then again, I could also be underestimating the power of. See, it really re- it would really require teaching because there's not that many blockchain developers. You know, so it's you know it's something where it's like you know there's no there's no blockchain development classes you know going on right now. Uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned. As far as I know, you know, if they're if they are, they're very small amounts. Hmm. Oh, maybe that's something to work on in the future too. Is like some sort of like tutorial site or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It seems like there's there's plenty of those for internet development as well as software development. Um, like. A, oh, I I, th- I think it'll start getting bigger. You know, that field will start getting bigger. It has to. Hmm. Yeah, I, I have to wonder about that. I, I was I was watching something Andrea Santinopoulos was talking about the other day, and he was saying something about how we don't have to worry about scaling lightning for millions of nodes. And I was thinking about that, and consider this. If you're going to do transactions via lightning, you need a what? Node. Right, you need a live node, right? 
Well, there's how many Bitcoin users in the world? About 30 million, 300 million, somewhere between there. So if all of us are, are going to be using Bitcoin, then we all need nodes. So then you definitely have to worry about scaling for millions now because you have millions of users now, right? Now, Yeah, makes sense. It's been my assertion this whole time that lightning isn't really meant for to be run like mining. That because of the custodial duties and, and so on and so forth, that only a certain number of people are going to be doing lightning. You know, that maybe banks will have a lightning node at their ATM or some shit like that. And that you you have like a card and you do it, you do it like you, you do an ATM thing now. But if you're not AML, CYK, KYC, whatever bullshit, you know, capable. Then you can't run one. Right. And that's why they're not worried about trying to make million, make it scalable for millions of nodes because they don't intend for it to be millions of nodes. They intend for it to be thousands of nodes. Banks. <coughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Because yeah, then everybody that's got a lending node would be a money transmitter. Right. Because <laughs> I mean, that's why you have the software for the purpose of transmitting money. Right. Yeah. Huh. That's interesting. Well, you know, and, and if you if you really think about it, it wouldn't be all that hard to do with um, licensure that you would kick out kick a lot of the people out um, via licensure requirements from Lightning. You know, so say like Lightning Labs says, you know, if your if your uh, transactions don't have this specific taint on them, we're not going to allow, uh, allow you to initiate a, a Lightning Network payment channel and. You know, and you only get that key if you have a license from them, an active license. And I, I've actually, yeah. I've actually heard the possibility of a, a subscription fee per transaction. I thought that was pretty hilarious. Hmm. But I, I think that would kind of satisfy that licensure need if, if, in fact, you were running a quote-unquote lightning node, and you know, so on and so forth. But, right. I don't know. As far as I see it, dude, I really think that the the segregated witness lightning network thing has been about privatizing Bitcoin and taking it back out of the public sphere. Yeah. Yeah, I'll agree. Yeah. So have you been considering any ways to mitigate the same effect with regard to Verge? Um, well, I mean, I don't think we're going to really need a system like that anytime soon. You know, our transactions are already so fast. I mean... Well, now, what, what are yeah. the specs on... I, I keep forgetting, like, block size and whatnot. What are the specs on Verge? Uh, we do, like, 100 and some odd transactions per second, or we're capable of. Um, and if we ever reach that, then... Psh, dude, if we reach 50 transactions per second, you know, I'll, that'll be great. <laughs> you know, we'll start worrying about what to do. And we'll come up with something easy, but we'll probably just end up making a uh, larger block size, you know? Yeah. Well, what's the current block size? Uh, just a megabyte, but I mean, you know, we produce blocks every 30 seconds, so it's not like we know, we, we never have blocks that are full and just, you know. So like in Bitcoin never, equivalent terms, in, in Bitcoin equivalent terms, you're doing like 20 megabytes, uh, 20 megabyte blocks. Yeah, yeah, we're going 20x on Bitcoin right now. Wow. And they're 30 second block so intervals, right? Yeah. Yeah, and, and a lot of the thing is, too, is, you know, Bitcoin wouldn't even have uh, a, a huge issue with full blocks if so many of the blocks weren't, you know, empty, you know, that ant pools mining, you know, but that's a whole other story. What? You know, the, how ant pool is always mining the empty blocks. They've been doing that for, like, years now. I had no There's idea. There's no transactions in them. They skip, they skip, like, transactions and they just mine the block and process it. That's it. Whoa, that's that's. You didn't know about that? No, Dude, that's like it's been happening for like years now. I had no idea. That's that's terribly interesting. Uh, that would explain the little dips in the in the uh, block chart every time I'm looking at the volume of transactions, where you see up down up down up down up down, <laughs> where they're they're skipping an entire block in between. That's, yeah, that's. Yeah, if you actually, if you go on blockchain info and you start looking, you'll see like ant pool. There's like two or three pools that do it, uh, and you'll just see like really abnormally low amount of transactions in a block, or like 
you know, like most blocks have about a thousand transactions, but you'll see blocks that have like ten transactions, five transactions, like one transaction. And those are. Fun. And you know that's a large that's a, and you know that's that's a block that's ten minutes where you know a, a thousand other transactions got got rejected you know from that block and now have to wait another ten minutes to be processed. So you know that's that's really you know a huge issue in and of itself, but. You know, if you ask them, they claim that you know mining empty blocks is a uh, a feature, not a bug. So, <laughs> to me, it's you know, to me, it's a problem. Dude, that's a major problem. I mean, you're you're causing a major backlog in the fucking mempool just to get the goddamn transaction. I mean, get the get the block reward. I mean, has there yeah. been any any discussion? Do you think on, or have you seen any discussion on uh, to address this on on the? Uh, um, from Bitcoin Core, uh, I've seen a lot of other people bring it up on the Bitcoin GitHub uh, and talk about it, but uh, it just kind of, you know, gets shut down. Dude, everybody's kind of whatever about it. That's 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 fucked. <laughs> that's just fucked, dude. I mean, because you're <laughs> basically you're holding up the the transactions. For, for 10 minutes for no reason. Yep. Ah. Dude, I've waited for two days for a fucking first confirmation. That's just... I could have double spent on the guy that that uh, finally... Because he gave me the money ahead of the transaction fulfilling. I mean, he, he handed me the money. I could have I could have just as easily gone back to the machine with the same receipt and hit it again and double spent on him. It, once it once I received the notification that the transaction cleared, but it was because I'd waited yeah. two fucking days for the transaction that he even did that. That is fucked up, dude. That's not a fucking feature. That's fucking highway robbery, dude. Yeah. Well, I I find it really unfortunate to hear something like. How long has this problem been going on? Oh man. I think like two or three years. I I don't want to hear another fucking thing about lightning until they address that shit. I don't want to hear another thing about Segwit or any of that bullshit until they address that. Because if that were happening on Verge, what would you do? I'd find a way to prevent it. (laughs) (laughs) That's just... You're trying to build a fucking world economy on, on some bullshit like that. What a fucking bullshit. That's nuts. Uh, I, Anyways, man, I gotta get going. Alright, sir. Well, thank you very much. You've been very, very gracious with your time, and we certainly do appreciate that. Yeah, of course. My apologies again for uh, last time. Oh, man, I don't give a fuck. It's been, I, it's been worth it. <laughs> well, sir, yeah. you enjoy the rest of your evening. And thank you, you very too, much man. again for coming on, man. Cool. Take care, brother. You too. Yeah. All right. That was fantastic, people. Fantastic. You got Mr. Verge Dev on and got a very in-depth interview about a lot of very pressing issues here in crypto. Certainly do appreciate you guys having joined us for that. We're not entirely done. We got more shit coming. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be here until, let's see, I started this at 2. So I'm going to be riding it until 5, and uh, we're going to throw down some music for right now, but let's go ahead. A little bit of Meshuggah, Future Breed Machine, here on Coin Metal. And that was Prong with No Way to Deny It. And there's no way to deny that was an excellent episode. So far, it's been an excellent episode. (sighs) <sighs> and I, I can't wait to get that thing up, just to listen to it again. I, I'm I'm amazed. I was I was kind of disappointed that we weren't able to get him on last week, but you know what? It, it, like I said before, it was worth it. It was worth it. We got a uh, a deep insight that is not really available to everybody. I mean, not everybody is a developer for a coin. Not everybody is an originator for a coin, you know? And uh, we had an opportunity to talk to one of the big ones. 
or at least one of the current big ones. I think we're still top 50. <clears throat> We've been top 10 at one point or another. And as a matter of fact, I think we were we were top at one point too. So, you know, it's uh, it's all relative, you know. Cryptocurrency being what it is and how it operates. <clears throat> and so, um, you know, let's get into some articles. Because we, we still got about, oh, 40 minutes. So that's more than enough time to hash some other stuff out. And, uh, yeah, why not? We got this... Uh, got this one about ethereum and this one this one has impacted pretty much everybody um i don't know if i don't know if it's ever impacted me um i don't know if anybody's ever ever tried to do this one on me at least nobody's ever asked me if i've if i've been the one that was going to be giving them the eth um but this one's on bitcoin.com and it was uh, it was authored by Jamie Redman, Redman, and let's do a check and verify really quick. He yes, Jamie yes, penis, authored approximately an hour ago. ETH bots run rampant while Twitter claims to ban lookalike accounts. According to reports. The social media platform Twitter has been deleting millions of fraudulent accounts per day and stated that during the first week of July that it suspended more than 70 million accounts throughout May and June. However, the cryptocurrency industry is still plagued by tons of ETH scam bots pretending to be Bitcoin luminaries, and this scheme has made these particular trend, uh, the, these particular fraudsters millions. Over the past few weeks, news, news.bitcoin.com had written about various Twitter scams and fake Ethereum giveaways that can be found throughout lots of conversations within the cryptocurrency industry. Some developers have been working on cryptographic solutions that can, a- can weed out the vast amount of lookalike Twitter scammers. The massive amount of phony, account- phony accounts use a person's profile picture, the same username, and these frauds typically jump into a conversation following a hot tweet and push their ETH giveaways. An example giveaway is you give them 5 Ethereum and they will give you 50 Ethereum in return after the funds are sent. This particular trick, even though it's pretty obvious to some people, has been able to help these imposters acquire millions of dollars worth of Ethereum. Then, just last week, Twitter detailed the media that they have thrown the ban hammer down on fake accounts and have been suspending millions a day. According to the Washington Post, the social media giant suspended 70 million accounts throughout May and June, even though the cryptocurrency ecosystem, these bots or spammers, are in full force impersonating cryptocurrency figures, executives, and even digital asset exchanges like Binance. Yet the bot problem has also plagued movie stars, musicians, and political parties as well. A researcher from Palo Alto-based think tank Samuel C. Woodley believes Twitter should be doing more to prevent spammers and bots. Quote, When you have an account tweeting over a thousand times a day, there's no question that's a, that it's a bot, said, said Woolley, a digital intelligence lab at Institute for the Future. Yeah, but there's no discerning between whether or not the... the bot is doing something legitimate or something illegitimate. Continuing on. Quote, Twitter has to be doing more to prevent the amplification and suppression of political ideas. And there's an example here. Um, Replying to Roger K. Veer, Binance, we're excited to announce our upcoming partnership with Roger K. Veer and App Blockchain Along with the partnership, we are now starting our airdrop. You do not have to be a Binance user to participate. Yeah, that's a false one. 
Even though Twitter claims they have been banning millions of fake accounts, the problem is still happening within the cryptocurrency industry. Lots of cryptocurrency bigwigs are being copied by lookalike accounts still to this day. For instance, on July 15th, the writer and speaker Andreas Antonopoulos shared a tweet of one of his latest talks. After the tweet, a phony CZ pretending to be the CEO of Binance states, A new promotion with support is available today. Get 200 Ethereum in your wallet now. You can use any wallet or exchange, blah, 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 or use a smart contract. Unfortunately, the Ethereum scam bots are alive and well on Twitter and are still able to spawn new accounts after the company claims to have thrown down the ban hammer. For now, these cryptocurrency spammers don't seem to be going anywhere soon. What do you think about this situation? Do you think Twitter is doing a good job taking care of its issue of this issue? Let us know what you think in the comments section below. You know, and that's more to the point that I'm I was talking about with regard to Bitcoin and in uh, uh, Verge Dev's assertion concerning. And that I'm I'm assuming if he said it, that is not a a just bland assertion. That that's like reality. Um, that that uh, Ant Pool has been skipping blocks worth of, worth of transactions. They just make the block and not the trans and not add any transactions to them. That's that's pretty damning. And the fact that Bitcoin isn't. I mean, the devs aren't doing anything to prevent that on the Bitcoin network. That's that's pretty egregious, man. I mean, it's like a like a um, a passive thing. It's like, okay, we'll let you get away with it as long as you keep mining Bitcoin. What do you bet if they couldn't do that anymore that they would stop mining Bitcoin? Oh my gosh, we're not going to get our free Bitcoin every ten minutes, every or every other, you know, every twenty minutes. We're not going to get our free Bitcoin or every ten minutes, whatever it is. Give me a fucking break, dude. You don't deserve it. I mean, that that to me is like a, a manipulation of the whole market model that that mining and whatnot is supposed to be a reflection of your confidence in a coin. And if you're only mining a coin because you're getting 12 and a half free coins every every uh, pay cycle or whatever, that that's bullshit. And and honestly, I think that the Bitcoin devs should be doing far more to be preventing that kind of abuse of the market. Because it is an abuse of the market. It's an abuse of everybody that uses Bitcoin. That that's going on. That their transactions are being held up unnecessarily in the mempool when they should be getting processed. Now, I don't consider that something that is a reflection on on the miners themselves i can i mean it's like verge dev was saying with regard to the guy that exploited verge is that it's like hey man good on you you fucking abused the network but we're not going to tolerate it we're going to fucking try and do something to stop it from happening in the future well come on fucking bitcoin core you're going to get all uppity and stop other people's bips from being considered put some shit forward stop the abuse Get those transactions in fucking blocks. That's something that falls on the on the shoulders of the devs. I mean, clearly, Sunrock took responsibility for it. Why can't they take responsibility for it on Bitcoin? But anyway, this this thing with Twitter, you know, they they get they get click through fucking kickbacks. So it's not really in their interest to do too much about the the Ethereum bots. You know, it's the same with Facebook, where they're they're starting to turn a blind eye now to crypto marketing happening on Facebook. They're not going to be blocking ads anymore, which is fine. You know, I I believe that we should see these abuses out in the open. We should stumble. We should fall. You know, I I saw something on um, on my Twitter feed and I clicked through to it and it was about this uh, kindergarten in Japan and how 90% of it was quote unquote outdoors and 
the idea behind it being that you know the the world doesn't have nice nerfed edges you run into shit you make faux pas shit happens make mistakes that's how you learn you know but there's a difference between making a mistake and allowing it to continue because it's benefiting you at the cost to the rest of the market and making a mistake and trying to make reparations which I think is the far more responsible path especially considering what we're trying to do here you know so yeah I, I don't I don't really put that on miners I put it on the devs they should be working to rectify the ship and rather than trying to run us into turning Bitcoin into a fucking visa. But yeah, it's it's like a permissiveness, though, that, that we're allowing the, the abuse to go on. And as far as I was talking about with Verge, I'm not, I'm not so concerned about the fact that, that it was exploited. What I'm more concerned about is that they're, the same entities are doing the same thing to the entire market. Now, with regard to it happening on Verge, okay, you got fucking lucky, you got ahead of the market, but we did rectify for it, right? But what if you're also doing it on Bitcoin Gold, and you're doing it on IOTA, and you're doing it on EOS, and you're doing it on all these other projects, and you're the same entity, and you're stealing billions and billions and billions and billions and billions of fucking dollars from everybody? What are we supposed to say about it then? Are we, are we supposed to say, oh, yeah, yeah. We, we don't care if it's the same entity extracting billions of dollars worth of liquidity out of the market. You know, we, I, I mean, I, I take both perspectives. And I think it's, just, it's all part of crypto, man. We're supposed to be falling. We're supposed to be getting the fuck back up and showing people by our rate of getting back up and what we do thereafter exactly how serious we are about running global monetary systems without governments and without banks involved or needed. I mean, for the moment, they are needed because, well, you know, the vast majority of the market out there is, in fact, denominated in fiat currencies. And so we need, we need on-ramps into what we're doing. And, you know, I, I know that there, there's been this fear about a, a single global currency, and then there's been proponents wanting it to be Bitcoin. And, and I can tell you right now, that's never going to happen. That's never going to fucking happen. It, it would be like somebody saying that there's only, ever go, there's only going to be Red Hat Linux. Every other variant of Linux is now not Linux, and you can't use it. If somebody said that to you, what would your response be? It wouldn't be, oh, I'm going to adopt Red Hat just to satisfy Red Hat and, and make them all happy. No, 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 no. No. Because among the people telling them to fuck off, of course, would be the people like uh, the CEO for Apple and the CEO for Microsoft and the CEO for Samsung <laughs> and and every other distributor that, that that's making their own variant of Linux. You know, Google would tell them to fuck themselves. So, what what's the likelihood that we're going to see a single cryptocurrency say to the rest of the world one day, you can't use anything else. You can only use Bitcoin. You're going to tell them to fuck off. I'm sure all of the all of the vendors that are taking Verge currency is currency now. You're gonna tell them to fuck off. I know I would. You know, I I didn't get into this so that somebody can tell me from top top down how I'm supposed to crypto. I got into this specifically because there is no such entity, and no matter what a government says or whatnot, there will never be such an entity. And I, I think it's. It's kind of disingenuous to address the cryptocurrency market as though that is a possibility anymore. You know, I, I think the best thing we can do is suggest best policies. Suggest best policies. You know, and of course, establish through our own practices what we believe best practices to be. 
but you know, putting putting your effort forward, doing doing the best to try and fulfill on the promises of your product. I think that is the the greatest thing any cryptocurrency can do in this this area, because there is so much writing on this. I mean, I I see in the future that there would be some sort of push to try and get it to where only government regulated entities are able to do this. But what I don't see is the capability to fulfill on that. And even the most repressive regimes on this planet have come to terms with the fact by now, including in the United States, and and I'll say that, um, that there really is no getting ahead of it. You, you, you can determine your license structure and all of that, and you, you'll have some level of compliance, but that's all you'll have. You won't actually have a reality of authority. The only authority that you're actually given will be that which is actually given, because it's not something you can take. It could just as easily be given to somebody else. And that, that's that's something that I know a lot of people would like to tell you, no, that, that's not real. You know, you, you, ha- you have no choice. You have to do that. And, uh, no, no, no. The choice is yours, where you put your confidence. How you decide to, to, to transact your currency is your business now. And that, I, I say it a million times on this show, but that's a freedom that only banks have enjoyed. You know, that they've been able to evaluate the the currencies on the fly and say, oh yeah, we'll, we'll put the money over here because it'll hold value over here more for a longer period of time and then we'll be able to transfer it over there. And, and to some extent, you and I have had access to those markets probably within the last decade or so. And I mean, we've had derivative markets that we can do that shit with and whatnot, but they're not, they weren't direct interfaces like they are with Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. I mean, at any time, you could you could go to your cryptocurrency exchange account and withdraw one of however many cryptocurrencies they host on that on that exchange into a wallet and then use it in the live market. You know, you could be doing OTC trades with them. You could actually be doing retail commerce with them. And I think, again, that's that's an aspect of cryptocurrencies. I think a lot of people would rather you forget. They keep talking about Bitcoin in terms of a store of value. Well, as I've said on this show, it doesn't have any fucking value if I can't use it as money. You know, I mean, to, to me, in most markets, gold is as good as a shiny rock. Because if you have a, a, a quantity of it big enough for you to spend... Or significant enough to to bother trying to transact and get into U.S. dollars with, there's a higher likelihood that somebody in my socioeconomic st- economic status would be knocked over the head and my gold stolen from me, or worse, than my being able to get it to a market where I can turn it into liquid capital. So in, in my mind, that makes it a liability and nothing better than a shiny rock. You know, and th- those of us who don't have access to Swiss bank accounts or, or big custodial accounts that can host our gold for us, you know, that that's the reality of gold, that we have to have shit like safes and stuff in our house. It's a major security liability. Anytime you leave the house, it's immediately in danger. It's in danger with you at the house. I mean, if if a force large enough to overwhelm you and those occupants of your home decides to come to your home and and acquire the gold without your permission um there's not really much you're going to be able to do about it you know i mean maybe you can gather some friends or something and they they can help you out or something but i mean not all of us have access to that kind of community so again it's a liability it's better that nobody knows that you have the money you know Fortunately for me, I'm like the shittiest trader in the world, so I don't ever have to worry about that. <laughs> anyway, let's go ahead and throw back down into some music. I know we went a little bit long last time, but it was because we had Verge Dev on for like an hour and a hour and change straight. So, I mean, 
I know I kind of tried to duck out a couple times, but it was because I was going brain dead. And I forgot that I had another brain on the other side of the conversation who could just as easily be generating content for us. So, fortunately, he's much smarter than I am. <laughs> anyway, let's go ahead and throw it back down. I want some clutch X ray visions here on Coin Metal. And that was Gizmachi with Voice of Sanity. I know I cut it off just a teeny, tiny, teeny, tiny short, but it is a pretty long song, and I did want to go ahead and close this episode out. Thank you, thank you, thank you again to Mr. Verge Dev, Soon Rock. I certainly do appreciate his presence here on the show, as I'm sure everybody else did as well. And uh, we will have this episode up on my YouTube channel as soon as I possibly can get it finished edited. And uh, yeah, so we will be back again on Wednesday at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So until then, I want you all to trade safe, do your homework, and watch out for your own bunghole because nobody else is going to do it for you. And so we are going to close this one out. I do have a last dance picked. And this one's by Infectious Grooves. Infectious Grooves. Thank you again for listening. As I said, we will be back again on Wednesday. And until then, y'all have an excellent, excellent evening. Good night.